Hey, this is Jay Jackson, and you're listening to Walk in the Floor. It's kind of mumbly, but... Yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> I'm walking the floor over you. Walking the floor. I'm walking the floor. Walking the floor over you. Hola, senors and senoritas. This is Chris Shiflett. Welcoming you to another edition of Walking the Floor. It's a gray day in Los Angeles, but I am enjoying it anyway because today is my birthday. So thank you to everybody on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all those various outlets that have been wishing me happy birthday wishes all day long. It's been very sweet, very nice to see that. Makes me feel loved. It's been a good week. Uh, not only did I interview uh, Miss Jade Jackson, who is my guest today, but I also interviewed Sonny Sweeney, so I'll get that one up real soon. And I uh, uh, wanted to tell you about, I created a Spotify playlist. Make sure to go on to Spotify and look for the playlist called Walking the Floor with Chris Shiflett, which you may uh, recognize as the name of the podcast you're listening to right now, so it's easy to find. So go on there to Spotify, find it, check it out, give it a spin, and please follow it. Also, also, uh, we announced that um, I am playing a solo gig in London on June 13th. So all you Londoners that have been harassing me on Twitter to come over there, look at that. I'm coming over there. A little solo gig. I'm opening up for Nick from Jet, who I believe has a solo record coming out. Thanks, Nick, for letting me jump on your show. And we're digging around for another uh, date. I'm probably going to announce another date the next night in London on the 14th, June 14th. So that'll be that. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop over in London on my way to begin the uh, food tour up there in Iceland. Had a couple free days. Figure why not go play a couple of acoustic gigs. It'll be fun. And before uh, that happens, make sure you get out there and check out my new record, West Coast Town, so that you know all the songs in the set before you come to the show. Got to go learn those tunes. Check it out. Um, and that is available everywhere you can stream or listen to records. All right, let's go on over to Zounds Town. Zounds.com your online home for music gear of all kinds. Let me tell you about how the shipping works over at Zounds. When you need to go get that music gear, you go on over to Zounds.com and they have absolutely free shipping on every order with no minimum purchase required, no exclusions. They also provide uh, fast two-day shipping for free on more than 90% of all the products they sell. So get on over to Zounds.com uh, where you will talk to a real musician and um, and they're going to help you get you whatever you need. That is Zounds.com. All right, let's get to the interview. Okay, so just this past week, I had the pleasure of sitting down with the young Jade Jackson, um, who I recently met when I opened up for Social Distortion, because Jade was the support on that tour, and her and her band were nice enough to let my band use all of their gear, which I thought was uh, very hospitable of them. And we did have a, a good little chat backstage, so I was looking forward to, to sitting down with her um, and doing this interview because she's uh she's a young artist she's just starting out she's just about to put out her very first record called gilded it's coming out real soon on may 19th on anti records um and it was produced by none other than mr mike ness who has kind of like you know been mentoring her produced a record taking her out on the road for the first time so let's see what uh, Jay Jackson has to say about uh, growing up in small town California and working with your musical heroes and and uh, and hitting the road and putting out your first album and all that cool stuff. This is Jade Jackson on Walking the Floor. Let's talk about your your record that's about to come out. So it's coming out May nineteenth. Now I've heard the three songs that are in Spotify, but that's that's all I've heard thus far what's what's the album called it's called gilded gilded okay and um 
I was thinking about it because I was reading a little bit about you on on uh, you know to get ready for this, and uh, and there was something that you mentioned like you listened to uh, Lucinda Williams car wheels on a on a gravel road like for four months or something leading into making this record. So I'm wondering like for you, um, where do you sort of see yourself stylistically in the world of like you know there's like country, there's Americana. I've I've read somebody referred to your album as country punk. Which I don't hear it as a, a country punk record at all, but maybe maybe that's the the motivation behind it. I don't know. I'm curious where you sort of see yourself. You, that's a hard question because I didn't like I didn't write any of the songs on the album with like the intention of like fitting into a right. certain genre because nobody ever does, right? Like nobody writes I, I don't songs think like so. that. Yeah. I don't think so. I mean, maybe some people do if they have like writers or if they're like super famous and they're trying to like right. hit a certain market. Yeah, yeah. But when I started working with Mike, he kind of just had me send him songs as I was writing, and and he sort of hand selected and chose the ones he thought would bet fit uh, best fit the album. Right. Um. I don't know. It's hard to say where I want to be stylistically because the biggest thing about me are like the most, like the, th- the thing about me is like I always, I'm always writing songs. Like I never thought I would be a vocalist or, a, you know, like I, the only thing I knew is that I was always going to be writing. And so uh, like as a songwriter, I don't really want to like pigeon my hole and si- pigeonhole myself <laughs> and say. <laughs> don't that, pigeon your hole. No, don't, don't. <laughs> nobody wants to do that. No. Uh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, it's just a hard question because if yeah. I go, oh, I want to be country, then I feel like subconsciously as I'm writing songs, right. I'm going to I'm gonna gear towards that and that's just not how I'm No, I know. I'm it's like kind that. of a lame question to ask and I hate when people ask me a similar oh. question, but the reason that I asked it was because in listening to the three songs that I listened to, like to me, they, they, they kind of could sit in a couple different worlds. Like I could almost like hear you on mainstream country radio, but I could totally see you opening up for somebody like Lucinda or Steve Earle or somebody in that world, you know, or like, and obviously you've done a bunch of shows with Social D and, and so you fit into that world too. You know what I mean? It's sort of, it's an interesting place artistically. Yeah. Um, I think that's, I mean, that's awesome for me because I like, you know, a lot of different artists, punk artists or country artists or, you know, and so, um, it'd be great to be able to be on the same bill as, you know, various different, people right you know i don't know well let's back up a little bit where did you grow up where are you from i it's again i'm referencing i think it was like your bio that i got most of the stuff from and it said small town california but i I didn't know which small town in california which small town well yeah the town i grew up in was like 1100 people and Mm. it's called santa margarita uh, in san luis obispo county i don't Uh, know if you're familiar with that area i'm from santa barbara Oh, then my yes. dad grew up in San Luis, so I'm I'm and I used to go visit him up there when I was like you know a kid. So oh, right, I'm on. a bit familiar with it, but I don't think I've ever been to Santa Margarita. It's kind of like okay, so there's San Luis Obispo, like the town, uh-huh. and then there's like um, I guess people would also be a little bit more familiar with like Paso Robles because it's like the right. wine country. So if you're driving from San Luis to Paso Robles, uh, it's like an exit, and if you blink, you're gonna miss it. And my car broke down in Paso Robles one time. Oh, Long shit. time ago. <laughs> it was one of the weirdest experiences of my young adult life. Was it in the Bro- summertime? Because that would suck because it I gets real hot. I don't remember, but it was, I was with my brothers who were crammed into my little pickup truck mm-hmm. and I got, I think the, the head gasket broke. Uh, po- you know. Yeah. I, I don't, I'm not a very mechanical guy, so I'm probably using the wrong terminology. Anyway, it blew and we were stuck on the side of the road and this cop came by and picked me up to drive me to go get like get help somewhere. Uh-huh. And we drove up to this, I think we were trying to get some water for the car. We drove up to this, it was like a farm or something. And we're in the middle of nowhere. It was a little outside of Paso Robles. Maybe it was in your hometown. I don't know. And and we go, mm. this could have been your house for all I know. Huh, and and we go and it's me and this cop, right? And little did he know that I had no car insurance and was driving with a suspended license, but he never asked. That's so awesome. I'm just kind of nervous anyway, you know, because you just kind of get nervous around cops to begin with. But um, And we get out of the car and, and we're like, hello, hello. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this dog comes charging over this little hill, rawr, rawr, like an attack dog. And me and the cop jump up on the hood of his car. And and the cops like, whoa whoa and, you know and then the guy comes out that owned it and and pulled the dog off but it was the most bizarre thing I don't know what that has to do with your record but that's well, where Paso Robles leads me that's my big Paso Robles experience that's your connection with yeah. with where I grew up you know that I think that has everything to do with my record um, <laughs> no I'm just kidding um, <laughs> no but seriously I mean in small town like when you grow up in a small town or like a smaller area like 
you know, without freeways or all that kind of stuff, there are wild dogs that will run right. up and attack you. And, you know, for me, one time, um, my mother and I got chased by a wild boar. Um, <laughs> really? And Margaret, yes. Rad. And uh, people were chasing it down, like, with a truck and screaming, and we're, like, walking to work, and, like, it's just... Okay, so it wasn't chasing us, but it was literally charging towards us and right. then went by us, thank God. Right. But, um, I mean, these sorts of things happen. It just, you know, it's it's part of the upbringing. Well, you know, when you weren't being chased by wild boars, like, how did you get the uh, the music bug? How did you wind up? Because uh, you started really young, right? I did. <laughs> now, I also read that you grew up without the internet, which somebody, I don't know exactly how old you are, but you're pretty young. And I tend to think of, you know, everybody past a certain point, just, you know, growing up in, in internet land. But I think oh, that's yeah. kind of, that's... That's a really good thing. I mean, I'm a, I'm a dad. I struggle with that with my kids, that they're just constantly on YouTube or on their little devices or whatever. But your, your childhood, am, am I right, it was like devoid of, of that Yeah, uh, as, my, a, as a harmful influence. Um, it was, yeah, my parents, I mean, we didn't have a microwave. We didn't have a television. Great. We didn't have a computer. And it wasn't just like, we're not going to have these things in my home. I mean, it went as far as my mom would sign papers in elementary school to keep me out of the computer lab. So I was the weird kid mm. doing packets, sitting outside by myself, right. while everybody else was inside playing. Like I think what was that pilgrim that that re- what was that game? It was like some really everyone was obsessed with it. Yeah, the Oregon Trail. Uh, oh, I, I never know. I never got to play that. So it was it was. That's good though, but I mean, that, I'm sort of getting to that was probably a really good thing for your development as a as an artist, as a songwriter, as a uh-huh. musician. I mean, if you're not wasting all your time and uh, goofing around with that stuff, yeah. And I say that as a very disgruntled dad. That I, I mean, I really mean that is like a constant struggle in oh, parenting now. But I if bet. you don't have that, and and I'm always like, why don't you guys go outside or mm-hmm. do something, practice your piano, do whatever, you know what I mean? And and it, it's it's a struggle. But if you didn't have that, were you sort of channeling your energies into Music. learning guitar or whatever it was? Yeah. Well, I actually started on piano. And um, I grew up in a small house. I, you know, I shared a room with my brother and sister. And so, like, when you your house is little, like, you spend most of your time outside. So I did. I spent most of my time outside. And if I was inside, I was usually sitting at the piano. Or my dad was playing records and you could hear it anywhere because the house was so small that there was mm. no getting away from what music he was playing what records was he playing um primarily early country and punk so a lot of hank williams echo and the bunnymen the gun club mm. johnny cash just you know i, I think he, he said he used to rock me to sleep to the damned when i was mm. a baby so those are the kind of artists um, that he loved and sort of seeped into my own heart right uh was there a point where you, like was there a point where you rejected your dad's music and then came back to it like you know, then which is no like that common. that that is a common thing I think. Um, but no, actually, um, my dad and I are really tight. We've mm. always been really tight. So because of that, um, I liked whatever he liked, and thank God he had good taste because um, I just got familiar with those artists at a really young age. So who would you consider your sort of your primary influences that that got you playing music? That got me playing. Well, that like um, were your parents? Did they play as well? No, they're just obsessed with with right. with playing and music, and music and stuff. Right, so, yeah, right, big right. music fans. Um, what got me into like playing? how did you why why did you pick up a guitar or piano uh, or what whatever? So it was? with piano, I guess when I was really when I was really young, um, I would hear like little melodies, and then um, we had like this little tiny kid xylophone, and I would just like go to the thing and start playing the melodies that were that I was hearing. Like so, my parents were like, "Wow, like." she she's going to be a musician like let's get her in piano lessons so mm. i took piano lessons from first through sixth grade and um and then my parents ended up opening up this restaurant so kind of all the money went towards that so i couldn't take lessons anymore um and my dad had an old guitar um and just actually it's it's kind of an interesting story i went to my first concert uh without my parents my first concert that like i bought tickets for and went mm. by myself was a social d concert when i was 13. really yeah and before then i had played piano i knew i loved poetry i knew i loved music but i had never wanted to be on a big stage mm. but um it's it's just a crazy story because when i yeah i went to that concert and i was by myself kind of aw- i was i was an awkward 13 year old you know just real right. shy and standing in the crowd looking up at Mike up on stage, I just saw how he captivated this large audience and um, got the, everyone was looking up at him. Like, I still remember the things he was saying. And, like, something kind of just clicked in me that set, that told me, like, I want to be on stage. Like, like, maybe that's where I can find my peace. Maybe that's where I can have a voice. Hmm. 
And honestly, I've had tunnel vision ever since I went home and I picked up my dad's guitar and I taught myself how to play from like, I got got like a guitar poster. So I would like play the chords on piano, look up at the guitar poster, put it on the guitar. And then that's slowly how I learned Mm. and started writing and shoot, like 10 years later, I got a call from Mike about wanting to work with me. And that's like the closest thing to any dream I've ever had coming true. I mean, do you, with your guitar playing, do you, do you, uh... Are you an unorthodox player because of it? Because of the, of the way that you just described learning how to play? Unorthodox? What do you mean by that? Like, Well, like, like you know, maybe like fretting chords differently than, you know, if, if you're sort of working it out from piano chords, you know, are you playing things a little different than like yeah. somebody that, you, you know, learned mm-hmm. in a more sort of t- traditional environment? Yeah. Well, one of the things I know, I used to go to, um, I guess when I was like 14, I made friends with this guitar picker in town. He was a lot, he was you know, 70 years old, and he would take me to these bluegrass jams, Mm. and I would just sit and watch. And so I I started kind of finger picking as the first kind of thing I was doing, Yeah. but I didn't learn correctly, so I was only using two fingers. So now I finger pick with two fingers, and everyone's like, that's so weird. Um, But that's all I can do. Whatever works, right? You know, yeah. So kind of have like my own style in that way. And So when did you start playing out in in like... um you know, when did you start performing live performing. and and did you do that as a solo artist or, or did you have uh, bands and stuff growing up? Yeah. So, I mean, I started writing songs probably, it's hard to remember exactly, but I think like a couple weeks to like a month after I saw that Social D concert. Mm. Um, and then once I started writing, I couldn't stop because right. I was always obsessed with poetry. And once I started getting these melodies in my head where I could put the two together. I mean, I, th- I only knew like two chords at first, but I'd written like 10 songs. And right. so I, now, uh, I read that you had, that you, when you, I don't know if this is something you still do, but there was a point where you were writing like a song a day. Oh yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. That, that, I, that, was an, that was an interview uh, I did in high school and, um, I did, I was writing like a song a day and I was homeschooled for most of high school because mm. I was just so focused Currently, I'm I'm more focused on this album release and touring and saving yeah, yeah. money and you know right. being 25. So I, I I get melodies in my head almost every day, but I I don't I don't find the time to sit down and put them on paper like I used to, which is a bummer. But um, I don't know, just learning and and growing. I mean, let's talk yeah. about that a little bit, like your songwriting process. Like, what? How okay. do you do it? Uh, it's um, it's literally like. It just like kind of fall like I don't. It's I sound weird every time I explain it because it it's literally like just throwing up. Like I just I literally <laughs> just like get this feeling in my stomach or my brain and like I have to find something to write with and I scribble it down hmm. and then I'm done. And that's how I'd written songs up until I met Mike. I just kind of scribbled them down. I mean I just have like things written on envelopes and like cardboard boxes and like anything just like piles of stuff and like laundry baskets in my room of lyrics when you're writing the lyrics like that are you hearing a melody and, and i hear melody and, behind and it? usually words like when i wrote gilded the title track of this album coming out i didn't even know what gilded meant i just like your silver tongue gilded her wings just like came into my head and sometimes mm. i'm like did i like was that from somebody else like did did somebody else uh you know, did I, where did I hear? I don't know, but whatever. I stopped questioning it. It just comes from somewhere I don't really understand. Um, but since I've started working with Mike, he's kind of showed me the craftsmanship of a song mm. and how like maybe instead of just writing the song and then going and performing it that night, like you should say, you should like take some time and realize it's in this green stage and like you can actually make it better. Refine um, it. And yeah. Instead edit. of having hundreds of songs that are so, so you can, kind of just spend more time on uh, certain songs that you think have potential and make them, you know, get to a higher level. So. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, you said Mike called you about um, to working together, but how did that come about? I mean, that seems like a huge break. Yeah. Or a huge I mean, opportunity. To- totally. Because I'd been, you know, playing for a decade before that and nothing really happened. But I was in my junior year of college. I studied music at CalArts mm. and... Um, I went home for, I think it was winter break, and I was just jamming with some neighborhood boys, and um, I hadn't played a show in a long time because I'd gotten in an accident my freshman year of college, and so that kind of derailed my music career for a couple years. But I um, 
I was feeling, you know, okay enough to to be jamming again with friends. And I was like, let's just go play a coffee house before I go back to school. And we did, and it was super fun. And uh, Mike's wife, Christina, and son were there. And they, um, they're they actually from San Luis County. So they had, like, heard of me. Uh, and um, Christina okay. went to high school with my mom. So, like, there was, like, that little connection. But yeah. Mike had never heard me. Um, but they heard me that night and um, decided that they wanted to, like, film a bit of it on their phone. Mm-hmm. And show him and from there it was just the right time the right place he was taking a year off um to do you know from touring and um he was like wow i i kind of want to work with this person i guess i guess that's what he thought i don't know what he thought but he called me and i was like you know it was a random number and i'm just like i think i was like cleaning the bathroom in my apartment just doing something really (laughs) shitty and i got this like random like number calling me and i like pick up and i I, I remember I was in the bathroom because I was looking at myself in the mirror and I was just like, I look like shit. And I just like picked up the phone and I was just like, hello. It's like, hey, it's Mike Ness. We're well, like, fuck you. Yeah, right. I, I didn't say that, but I dropped, <laughs> I think, cleaning products or whatever I was holding and just was just like, what? Like, what? Huh? Like, you know, and he was just like, hey, like, I heard you, you know, and he went on to invite me to his studio. And yeah, yeah that's a good Mike Ness impersonation, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I just. And then I was terrified because sure. I grew up listening to his music and he's like this, you know, punk rocker, like yeah. eats nails for breakfast. I don't know. And I'm going to meet him for the first time. And I was terrified. And, you know, I just immediately called my dad after he called me and told him. And my dad's like, this is great. Like, you know, just make sure you have good blood sugar when you meet him. Like, be your best self. Like, bring your guitar. <laughs> right, so yeah. I remember sitting out in my car before I even went into his studio mm. and like counting out almonds, like, because I read what amount of almonds would give you like your best self your best blood sugar like i was just so way too excited and uh went in to meet him and he was the nicest calmest most amazing human Mm. i've ever met and it wasn't just like a a first impression like first time i met him sort of thing i mean i've known him for three years now i'm staying at his house right now okay while i'm in uh la and yeah him and his wife and his family have just helped me they i mean they're really responsible for everything that's happened good these last three years well how how would like you describe him as a producer what's that like in the studio and you you know there's there's a point like and this is an interesting thing i think when you work with with people that are are your heroes or influence people that you know that that you look up to Mm -hmm. there's always a point in the studio where like you have to get past that or you it can't be like you know there's like friction of ideas Mm -hmm. and and you and and you know, was there a point for you where, where you guys broke through that, like, um, you know, I'm working with one of my heroes thing to like, this is really just a, a producer and an artist? Honestly, I don't think that happened. <laughs> okay. I, be, because I still feel weird, like uh, pinching myself right. just talking to him. And, and I mean, I don't want to be like the weird, like starstruck person, but I am, you know, sure, and then like, sure. and when we were in the studio, like, I had these songs and like these ideas and ways I wanted it to go. And sometimes he would, you know, for example, we have this song motorcycle mm. on the album and it's kind of like this Western ballad. Like you just strum like, you know, the big open chords, but for first, people listening, you can watch that video on YouTube. Oh yes. As I did yesterday. Yes, you can. Uh, but at first when I, when it came into the studio, it was an intricate kind of hypnotic finger picking song. Mm. And so in the studio last minute, he wanted to try this new kind of guitar playing and, I felt my heart break a little bit because I was so used to the the picking, but but then that part of me was just like, well, first of all, I I have I write so much that I'm not really, I, I don't really. It's okay that he wants to change certain things right. because I, I have a lot of different songs. I'm not too attached to right. any particular you don't get song. Too stuck on the demo. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, but I w- it, it was weird because it was just so last minute. Let's do it this way, and I was just like, but I really kind of like it this way. And he's just like, just trust me. Like this is how it should go. And and then I, I guess that's what the key word is trust. I just trusted him. I just mm. realized he's had you know, X amount of years in the music business. He knows what he's doing. He's trying to help me. That's the thing I feel like a lot of people don't understand when they're collaborating with people is that everybody wants the, they, everyone has the best interest for the project. Mm. Um, so I really knew that about Mike and I kind of just let him do his thing and ultimately was very happy with the product. Did he play you know? on the record too? He did. Oh, okay. um, he, he has, um, 
a little guitar solo on uh, Good Time Gone. Oh, okay. Um, but Is that I, him playing rhythm on some of those songs? No, that's actually my guitar player. Um, his name's Andrew Rebel. He's worth talking about. That guy's insane. He plays everything. Hmm. Um, he played most the uh, instruments on the record. and. Uh, so you put a band together before you went into the studio? Yeah. When I first met Mike, got a production contract, um, went in and recorded a demo with Social Distortion, and then we shot that to a label, got a record deal, and Mike had me audition a band. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so that so you, sh- you shopped around the demo. So that's because I was going to ask you how the deal with Anti came about. Yeah. So originally, Mike had funded this. It was originally going to be half of the record that we were going to eventually release, and so we did four songs as with Social D as like the backup band, mm. and like this is like insane for me can i just say like going there and like from meeting mike's phone call to going into the studio i think there was only like three or four months in between so i was just like in in shock head spinning and it was like had you had i'm I'm curious like (gasps) prior to all this stuff going on had you had any brushes with success or gone out and like you know showcased for labels or done any of that sort of stuff no nothing in the music business like i had um opened for some great heroes of mine like i got to open for merle haggard and uh, mm. charlie daniels band and things like that when i was younger because there's this place called the pozo saloon where i live because i was like a local artist i feel like the promoters at the venue was like oh she's a local girl like we'll have her open up the show right you know when gates open and nobody's there but still she gets to be sure playing you know yeah and, yeah. and so i had done that before i also self-produced two albums in high school um, and funded those so those were both just Do those exist on, on the internet anywhere? They don't anymore. Because um, <laughs> with the label deal and everything now, we're kind of trying to uh, yeah. focus everything towards the, That's cool. the debut That's cool. record release yeah. thing. Um, but yeah, n- not really. I mean, I've always... It's not like I really expected any of this to happen, but I've always envisioned it and prayed about it, like literally every single night. So mm. it's really exciting now. So, so working with Anti, are you, do you uh, work with uh, Brett Gerowitz? at all like a d are you in contact with him i like i don't know how it works over there like yeah. how in, involved in the sort of day-to-day stuff because he's also i mean you got mike, mike ness producing it but then brett gurowitz is the label head. It's like you know you're surrounded by these amazing punk rock icons you know totally no yeah the, um i love anti uh it's I don't, you, but, well, before I had a record deal or anything like that like you would just hear stories especially being in a small town like I heard the story so many times, and I don't know if this is true, don't quote me on this, but my dad's like, you know, Credence Clearwater Revival, like, they got screwed, and like, you don't want to, like, everyone's sharks in the industry, and they're going to Yeah, all those stories are real. And like, oh, I mean, I don't know, <laughs> but like, that, that's all I yeah, heard. So sure. that's kind of like what I thought was going to happen, hmm. but with Anti, it's completely different. It's like a family, like everybody right. is just super nice, super kind talks to you like you're already somebody when you're not you know and, right um well brett's somebody that you know came up the hard way and and mm-hmm. is is a musician and knows that side of the experience very well so I'm, i wouldn't be surprised that he would run his label in a far more artist friendly oh a total, fashion very artist artist friendly i would say and yeah. it's it's cool how everything's kind of just like a family like with Mike being in the same label. I mean, Mike's manager is now managing me, and sure. like it's just like it's this really cool kind of tight knit family. There's nothing weird or like businessy or we- I mean, it's businessy, but you know what sure. I mean. Like, there's sure. it's not like the stories that I've heard. Um, it's a lot better than that. Does does Mike's sort of production side of things extend into into your live show as well? Because I noticed at the that show in Seattle where we opened for you guys oh, uh-huh. that like during soundcheck, I mean, I couldn't hear what he was saying, but I saw him go up and talk to you guys sort of between songs at soundcheck. And I I didn't know if he was like kind of like helping even with you know, the sort of the live side of stuff. So that still feels unreal, but literally Mike would come to every one of our sound checks and then he would wait in the wings and listen to every one of our shows. And oh, that wow. was like the coolest thing. Ever. Do you get good? Did you feel like like over the course of that tour that you, you know, you guys were yeah. tweaking things and making it a better show? This was my first tour. This was my first. Oh, that's the first time you've been on the road. Yeah, period. yeah. Oh, Before wow. I, the first time I left the small town, really. Right. So Mike was kind of just like, you know, like an, a father to me. Really, I mm. mean, he he would watch if he thought I could improve on something. Like he would he would tell me, and I would try it. How's and... your between song banter going? 
between song banter. <laughs> you Come know, on, Las different. Vegas, you motherfuckers. You get into that shit. I want to hear this side of the room go, woo. No, you know, I actually noticed yours. You have, you have great, you have great free song banter. I was like, uh, damn, why am I going on after this guy? Why did we open for him? Like, because you really, you really got the crowd going. And that's something uh, I'm learning. And I think it's different crowd to crowd or sure. or maybe you're supposed to yeah. um, treat all crowds the same. I That's don't a know. funny thing though, isn't it? Because some nights you feel like you're on top of the world with oh, that yeah. stuff and like you can do no wrong and then sometimes it just falls so flat and you're like, wait a minute, what? What just happened? Oh god, That was, that fucking sucked. Like that was, last night was so good and tonight was awful. I, I definitely had that experience on the road because yeah, we, like you know, this is my first tour. I don't even have a big album out and we were, I think we were in, um, I don't, I don't remember where we were. I think it was like Colorado or something. And like people were screaming before I even started talking. Oh, that's the best. And just jumping. And like this one lady was singing like all the words to my song, which mm. has never happened before. Like, well, she was singing the ones that had been released and right. then like mouthing the other ones like she knew them. And I was like, this is just awesome. And I just like felt on top of the world. The next night was the same. I, like a bunch of people came up after and wanted to meet me. I'm like, this never happens. This is, this is the new, like, this is what's going to happen from here on out, guys. Like we made it. This is rad. And then we had another show. And it was literally like you could hear crickets. Right. And then, and then you think like, what am I doing wrong? Right, right. Like, this is my fault. Yeah. I'm going to die, you know? I think, it's a, <laughs> it, I think it's kind of an amazing thing. I mean, I don't know if you experienced this, but it's so easy to misunderstand how a crowd's feeling on stage. Because mm-hmm. I think, at least for me, and I think for a lot of people, when you're on stage, very insecure feeling. You're very exposed. You're yeah. like singing your songs, like this, you know, heartfelt thing. And... Sometimes you can sit there and you can think, oh, God, this whole, these guys, they hate us. They're not freaking out. Oh, that's terrible. And you sort of like go down that rabbit hole. And then like afterwards, people come up and tell you how great the show is. And you're like, oh, I was completely wrong again. <laughs> that happens yeah. like, that happens kind of more frequently than, than I wish it did. It's a funny thing. I think that comes out of like punk rock stuff because nowadays we're also preconditioned to like a crowd's got to go completely ape shit. Or you think, oh, it was a terrible show. But, you know, then you go up there. I mean, you know, when I play like my solo stuff, it's not a crowd going apeshit kind of music. You yeah. know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. a little more laid back. And they want to listen. Right. You know what I mean? So it's, it's, it sort of distorts your perception of, of what people in the room are feeling. Yeah. And I feel like once you start to go down that thing, then people clue into you being insecure. You know what I mean? It's a weird <gasps> yeah. mind fuck between you yeah. and the crowd. You know? I, I completely agree. I feel like it's like, you know, at the end of the day, like we're all animals and we can sense when somebody's uncomfortable. Totally. Like dogs can sense when you're yeah. scared and then they'll come and attack you like you and the policeman. <laughs> you know, like totally. if you guys weren't scared of it, maybe he would have just sat down and started licking you. I don't right. know. Yeah. But they you they can <laughs> they can they can sense the crowd can sense when you're when you go down that Absolutely. rabbit hole. Um and so when I do start going down that rabbit hole, I'm like, No, like get out, you know, but then, but then it's just so overwhelming, you know, with everything going on. And then sometimes you just go into like this flush of emotion and then the show's done and then you're not even sure how you did. You know, you didn't mess up, but you're not sure how it went. So then you're kind of looking around, uh, like I'll look at my manager or at Mike or at at the guy, my band and be like, how, like wait for somebody to say good job. And if they don't, then like your heart crushes. And then, and then all of a sudden they say it was your best show. And you're like, what the fuck? just happened right like right, i don't yeah. even know you oh know, yeah it's, it's like a wild. whirlwind yeah it's a whirlwind yeah it's 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 awesome though <laughs> but it, it's, it's weird fun. it's a it's like a rush like no other oh yeah um okay i this is kind of a left turn um and i don't know if this is something you care about at all but i have keep getting people asking me to get more into like gear talk on my podcast oh you gotta talk about gear you gotta talk about guitars yeah. and all that stuff are you a gear hound at all? Like, do you have like a special guitar that's like your magic guitar? Like, you know, anything along those lines? Yeah. So, um, I have had this guitar that I have here. Um, I've had it since I was 13. Um, it's a Taylor. I mm-hmm. love it. I'm upset. Obs- I'm obsessed with like the, um, eventually someday I want to get like a, a Emmy Lou Harris, like dreadnought Gibson. Mm. Like that's my dream guitar. Yeah. Um, with your name down on the Yeah, I'm totally. not there yet financially or, you know, whatever, but someday. Um, Gibson, if you're listening, <laughs> feel free. Feel free, yeah. Um, Go those, to jjackson.com. <laughs> don't know. No, I mean, but I just think those guitars are beautiful. Yeah. Um, my 
kind of right hand man uh, guitar guitarist Andrew Rebel. He is a gearhead, mm. um, and so I wish he was here. He could. I just know Mike's tell a you, gearhead. I've been to his about. studio. Oh it's yeah, ridiculous. Mike too. Ridiculous. Yeah. So yeah. So when Andrew and, and um, Tyler and Jake, the other guys in my band, mm. when we went, when they got to go to Mike's studio for the first time, uh, they were just like in heaven tripping out and i'm in i mean i'm in heaven because like i appreciate everything but i never really i don't know like all the names of everything you know right. what i mean i just know like i like that i love that that feels good this is great you know all you need to know about gear is that the old stuff is always better that's that's, that's pretty much if you just kind of use I mean, that as your guiding light that's sort of like everything in in well at least like with furniture and like right. houses that's right, kind of right, how right. i feel about Cars, everything whatever yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah style in general mm-hmm um, well, okay. So you said that, uh, that, that was your first tour. Um, mm-hmm. what's next for you? your albums coming out soon, yes. May 19th, right? Yep. May Gilded 19th. hitting stores everywhere. Oh yeah. And then, uh, and then what are you hitting the road doing the big, the big push? Yeah. Um, yeah, we, well, we don't have anything really locked in right now. Um, but we're planning on just being on the road and, uh, and touring as much as possible, as much as I can, you know, nice. I want to, I want to do it for the rest of my, I want to be like Willie Nelson. So totally. if I could start now, old and, just and keep wrinkly going. with a bitch and bandana. Yeah. That's all I want. Let's that's go. really all I want. And the long braids and you know, the, the really, you know, charming banter. That's, that's my dream. You've got a long way to go and you need to uh, <laughs> beat the shit out of that guitar for about 50 more years and get that big hole in it. And then, then you'll be there. I'll be there. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of which, would you like to uh, perform a tune? I mean, I I brought it in case you'd ask. Let's do I'm, it. Some people totally do, some down. people don't. I don't. I, you know, I, I always love it when people do, but it's okay. It's sure. not required. Yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna play you a song. Um, this is actually a song about that small town I was telling you about. Growing up there, uh, it's called Back When. <clears throat> Are we rolling? Yeah, we're rolling. Okay. <laughs>
Thanks for letting me play your guitar. I really, I want to take it home with me. All right, that was Jade Jackson. You know, I can't even believe it. I forgot to uh, bring up with her that her name is almost my nickname. Jake Jackson, that's my Gimme Gimme's persona. Jake Jackson, Jade Jackson, it's almost exactly the same. So we're practically like, you know, cousins or something. All right, she's got an album called Gilded coming out on May 19th on Anti Records. You can check out jadejackson.com to see what's going on. I know she's going to be hitting the road again and going out and supporting uh, her album that's about to come out. She's got a couple of songs up in Spotify too, so go check that out. You can find her on Twitter, at jadejacksonband. While you're uh, out there on the internet, go to Spotify, check out and follow my new playlist, Walking the Floor with Chris Shiflett. You can stream my new record, West Coast Town. Get on over to uh, the iTunes and check out all my previous interviews on Walking the Floor. They all live in the iTunes uh, store forever. So just go check that out. Leave a nice review. You know, all that stuff. And London, I'll see you soon, baby. All right, that's it for this week. Adios, amigos!